This is a uh, short video I'm doing on the geography and a little bit of the geology of Wales. And uh, it's part of my homeland, I guess you could say. At least it was for generations past in my family uh, who immigrated to Ohio back in about 1840 or something like that. So this, uh, this presentation is kind of uh, a little close to home for me. So it's, uh, it'll be fun to uh, share with you some insights that I had while I did my uh, sabbatical in Wales in 2016. Now I've been to Wales like maybe four times, I think, all together now. Uh, beginning back in about 1990, I visited for the first time. So um, this, is, this is more of the more recent stuff here. Um, it's a fascinating place. I think it's, uh, it's an interesting place. It's worth visiting if you ever have a chance to do that. There are many more people in the United States who have Welsh backgrounds and what they really realize. Many of the names like Jones and Evans and Davis and all of these names actually come from the Welsh. And so Howell, Powell, Pritchard, uh, all of these, all of these sort of names, Upjohn. Um, so um, anyway, I hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. I guess the best place to begin with uh, the country of Wales is to uh, imagine what you think of when you hear the term Wales, I guess. Uh, in America, most people think of these giant, lovable sea mammals who come crashing down next to boats and things like that and catch a bunch of krill and so forth uh, to make their living. Uh, that is not the way that Wales is spelled, however. It's a funny derivation, actually, for the name of the country Wales. It's not actually the name that people from Wales actually refer to their country. Suppose, first, we should think about what Welsh people think of their own country. And uh, they, they had a really great uh, football team, a soccer team, uh, back a few years ago. Uh, made it into the World Cup. And here you can see uh, Gareth Bale, who's uh, holding the Welsh flag behind him. A uh, very patriotic time in Wales at that uh, moment. They also won the Six Nations rugby uh, title just a couple of years ago here. And so here's the Welsh Rugby uh, Union in um, trying to, to make a score with the rugby uh, ball tucked in there. So uh, the Welsh are very uh, active uh, people, very um, athletic people, I guess you could say as well. Uh, there's also other things that people think of in Wales. They also think of... Pretty much all of the pirates in the Caribbean were Welsh. Uh, Sir Henry Morgan became the governor of Jamaica at one point, but there was actually a, well, my dad's uh, name is John Evans, and so there was a John Evans who was also a pirate. Many of the pirates, like Captain Teach, Captain Kidd, all these various pirates, they were all Welsh because the Welsh were incredible sailors, and so much of the British Navy was populated with the Welsh. Uh, Sir Thomas Jones, right? So you, Tom Jones is the famous Welsh singer. And so if you ever want to hear some great uh, singing, he's the one who has this golden voice. Uh, you may think of the dog, the Welsh corgi. It's a uh, rabbit dog, essentially. And so you, uh, the queen has a couple of corgis, I think, and the breed's very popular. And then, of course, if you live in Wales and you think about the Welsh uh, landscape, it's very... It's incredible, in fact. So that's one of the beaches in Wales at the very bottom down here called Ox. I think it's uh, Oxwich Beach and uh, really fascinating place. And then lastly, the Welsh had this really bizarre uh, fashion uh, statement that they made back in the late 1800s here. You can actually see the old stovepipe hats that women wore uh, in, in Wales. And so they would wear these sort of wool uh, uh wraps around them and then they, you would also see the uh, stovepipe hat making some sort of uh, fashion statement for them. Uh, they're very austere people uh, <clears throat> in the fact that they don't have uh, a very easy life. Most of the Welsh did not have an easy life back in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. Uh, but, uh, but they're an industrious people and very uh, bright and so they immigrated across the oceans to places like Ohio for my family and then also to places like in Patagonia. Uh, so there's a Welsh diaspora around the world right now, uh, Australia obviously too. Um, so uh, this title is uh, going to be Walks in Wales, Finding Roots in a Foreign Land. And there's a play on words here actually because the word Welsh <coughs> 
The name of the nation is actually a Saxon word, which means foreign. And so they were named by the Saxons who lived in England uh, as being a foreign people. And so they, uh, but the, the name for the Welsh themselves is Cumru, Cumru. And uh, Ungumru is a, the, there's a, they have their own language, right? And so Ungumru, uh, and in fact, my name would be uh, Kevin Even, I-F-A-N is how they spell it. And then uh, Kevin is C-E-F. Y N it's C it's pronounced K E V the uh, Y is like the I and uh, even is actually the Welsh name for John and so it's like essentially Johnson or something like that so but uh, so Kevin even I would actually in the Welsh language I would be named for my father so I would be Kevin Ep even which is my dad's name John right so. Uh, you have uh, the Mac uh, as being the son of. In Wales, it's Ap, which is essentially the same meaning. So I would be Kevin, Ap, John, Ap, uh, Morgan. And uh, it could go on, you know. But, uh, you, you, but that's how they identified themselves. It was a very patronymic sort of uh, nation uh, back then. So uh, the very bottom uh, photo here is from Ross Ely Beach. That's on the Gower Peninsula. Uh, sticks out into uh, the uh, Bristol Channel. Uh, Wales is not easy to spot, I guess you could say, but it's that western part of, uh, of London. You know, you see where London is, is noted on the British, uh, on, on Great Britain here. In, in, uh, so Wales is that part that sticks out to the west, essentially, into the Irish Sea there. Um, so the name Wales means whale, meaning foreigner. In the Welsh, it's Kimru, Gumru, and Kimrick is the people, and then Kimrick is the uh, Latin for Cambria. And so, uh, well, Latin, it's Cambrian. So remember, the Cambrian time period is based on the Latin, and so even the Romans recognized the name of the nation as Cambria, like they recognized that Scotland was Caledonia. Uh, so the national anthem is Mahin Ulad Ver Vai Nayadu. Yeah, it's, uh, essentially, it's like the land of my fathers. Um, if you look at studies of the DNA for uh, men of Wales, they're almost uh, exclusively R1B1 is the, uh, the genetic haplogroup, and uh, it's considered to be a super haplogroup because it goes all the way across the western part of Europe. And it's the earliest immigration of Europeans into this landscape. And so there's a relationship between the Welsh and the Irish and the, and some of the Scots and then also the Cornwall uh, area in Britain. And then also for Brittany, which is across the English Channel, it's in that northwestern part of, uh, of France. And then if you were to trace it on farther to the south, you would see that the Basque peoples are very similar. Now, they have a very different language, but the Basques and the Welsh. And then the Galathians. The Galathians would be in the northwest corner of Spain as well. So they're all sort of considered to be Celtic nations. Uh, the Basque are not Celtic, however, but the Basque and the early uh, arrival, the earliest peoples in Wales are probably related. And in fact... Uh, one of the unusual things, I guess, for my own family is my father was very dark complected. And so many of the earliest settlers in, uh, in that area would have a dark complexion, much like the Basque in uh, France and Spain. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting place and it is a little bit different. It's not British. Well, it is British, but it's not English <laughs> by any means. So, if you were to consider uh, calling somebody English who lived in Wales, they would take that as an insult, I guess. Uh, although I'm part English myself, you know, my own heritage here. Um, as far as the size of the country, it's a very tiny country. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it, and, but and population-wise, it's also very tiny. It's about half the size of Scotland population-wise. So 3 million people live there. 6 million people live in, in Missouri. Uh, the landscape is a little bit more rugged than what it is in Missouri, however. Uh, you know, we have the St. Francis Mountains, which are the highest and the, the most rugged sort of peaks, you would say, in the Ozarks, at least the Missouri Ozarks. And uh, if you went to Wales, you would find that Snowdon is this huge mountain. In fact, it rises to 3,560 feet. 
but that is just a few miles from uh, the actual ocean, right? So you go up immediately into uh, high landscapes like that. In the south, there's Penny Van, which is a, a really pretty high uh, peak as well. Uh, somewhat over 2,200, 2,300, something like that, I think. But it's a, it's a relatively high uh, landscape when you get to Wales. So if you're to iron it all out, <laughs> it would be uh, you know about the size of Missouri then. Uh, the, the national flag is the red dragon. Uh, and then the national flower is the daffodil. It's the flower of David. David is this uh, patron saint. There's a Saint David in Wales. And that's his flag actually on their right hand side. And so that is the uh, part of the flag that uh, that a lot of the Welsh uh, patriots like to fly. It's it, I think it makes a political statement. At least some people have told me that. And so there's this there is still a kind of a separatist movement for Wales. They do have their own parliament and things like that, but they're still regarded as part of the United Kingdom. And I have some Welsh friends and they say, well, I, you know, that's the only thing I've ever known. I think that's what we keeps people within the United Kingdom. You know, it's like they have more in common with the English and the Scottish than they do with any other nations. And so uh, there is some protection being a small nation uh, under the umbrella of the United Kingdom. OK, so when I went to Wales in 2016 for the sabbatical, I had some questions I was asking, you know, it's like, so who am I is one of them, right? Am I Welsh? Well, no, I'm American, right? So America is made out of all these various nationalities. You know, when people immigrate here, it, we've been referred to as the great mixing pot. But how much mixing is there really? So, uh, and could I find where my ancestors came from? You know, they, they actually sailed out of Liverpool, but they lived in Wales. And so that would be going back about five, six generations, okay? Uh, so, yeah, it was my great grandfather, my great-great-grandfather who came from Wales, and then my great-great-grandmother on the same boat, right? And uh, so, you know, what you could also say is like, this is the time, it's like, what's the meaning of life and what's life's purpose? What's my life's purpose? And so I, I got to visit some places that were just absolutely astonishing when I was in Wales, and it's the landscape that my ancestors would have viewed as well. Uh, so, and in in the, one of my favorite places, in fact, is this area where you can see the lighthouse there. That's the metaphor for this, right? So that's the Mumbles is the name of that community down here. You, know, you can see it along the beach down here. This place is absolutely amazing because they have a tidal range that is something like 27 feet. Um, so the entire bay essentially drains out and then comes back in within 12 hours. So it's a very dangerous place to be out playing in the seafloor, but you can see it at low tide over here on the right-hand side. Um, Here's my family right here, actually, that my father is the fourth one over in this uh, portrait here. This was taken after World War II. Uh, okay, give you a little bit of background here. That's my Uncle Jiggs on the left-hand side with the eyes closed there. He, uh, he passed, well, all of my uncles have since passed away now. Uncle Tip was the second uh, gentleman over. And then Uncle Gabby, or Kenneth, is my the third gentleman over here in this uh, that has the Evans written on his uh, pants there. I think that's the uh, the photographer put that on there. And then my dad was Art over here, and that's my Uncle Bob. He's the only one who wasn't a veteran in World War II because he was just too young. And uh, so all of the others were veterans. And in fact, I even lost one of my uncles in Pearl Harbor. He was on the uh, USS Arizona, the battleship uh, BB-41, I think it is. Uh, so Uncle Jiggs was in the Navy. My Uncle Tip was in the Navy. My dad and Uncle Gabby were in the same uh, outfit. They were in uh, combat engineers, but uh, combat separate unit. And so they were in Alaska uh, during World War II. Many of the folks that they signed up with uh, in the Third Army uh, actually went to uh, North they went to North Africa, and then they went to Sicily, and then they went to Italy, and then they went to the South of France. And so they really had to slug it out in World War II uh, with the fascist uh, armies. So uh, but Uncle Bob, then he, uh, many of these folks are really public servants. So my uncle went in the Air Force. Uh, uncle Gabby went in the Air Force after he left the Army. And uh, then he became a postal uh, a worker after that. So he was a triple dipper, essentially, you know, a double dipper. He had Social Security and uh, federal government retirement, military retirement. And uh, and the rest of them were like they worked for utilities, railroads, 
Uh, my Uncle Jiggs was a carpenter. Of course, my Uncle Paul, who was killed at Pearl Harbor, uh, had just, he was 19 years old. And uh, he was a great baseball player, actually. So a couple of my family have uh, tried out for the majors. Uncle Tip and Uncle Bob did. Um, and uh, and uh, broke his toe, actually. So they didn't get signed. Uh, so if you step back one more generation, so all of those sons were the son, all of those uh, guys. Okay, so I, what's not in this last photo here are the two sisters, uh, Aunt Ruth and Aunt... Uh, and, and, and Aunt, uh, oh God, it's like they've all passed away now, so I don't remember their names all the time every day. Uh, so Aunt Annie, and uh, so Aunt Ruth and Aunt Annie were the two sisters. There were six boys and two two girls. And they came out of this family, another large family. And so that's my uh, John W. Evans in the front row there, the uh, in the middle with the beard. And his wife off to his right there, and those are his daughters around him here. There's one, two, three women and four boys. And so my grandfather is in the back row. He's the he's the second man over essentially. Uh, so he's the uh, the one in the dark suit there. So that's Morgan right there, and uh, his grave. So all of these folks are gone, uh, and all of my uncles are gone now. So I guess it's a life lesson right here. Uh, memento morti, remember that you will die. And so that's a very stoic sort of observation. And all of these people have lived and died. You know, they say that we're usually right in the dash, right? So they always record when you're born and they'll record when you died after your death. So anyway, that's uh, from a cemetery in southern, kind of southeastern Ohio. Many of the Welsh uh, boarded ships and sailed to, well, first New York City, where the port was, and then came across through uh, Pennsylvania and eventually made their way to Ohio, where there was a little area called Little, Carid uh, little Cardigan. And uh, it was um, from people from that area. They were all what they referred to as nonconformist in their religion. They were Methodist and Baptist and so forth, uh, but they didn't belong to the Church of England, essentially. And so being nonconformist, they were actually taxed more and they couldn't get certain jobs in government and things like that. So there was some discrimination against people who had uh, held different religious beliefs in Wales. Um, so Margaret Evans down here at the bottom was his mother, and uh, she sailed in 1840. So it actually says that she's from Wales, a native of Wales, just below where, in between where it says died and her name on there. Uh, so memento mori, remember you will die. Uh, here's one of the area. This is an early photograph of the area where they sailed into New York Harbor. So this is on the Battery on the south end of New York City in the East River. And that is a ship that resembles the Orpheus. And it was part of the Black Ball line uh, sailing out of Liverpool. And so that's how they distinguish their sails. You can see the Black Ball on the sail right there. That's actually the SS Montezuma. But the, uh, the Orpheus had the same sort of... Uh, uh, arrangement of sails and so forth. And down here at the bottom, you can actually see where the Black Ball Line would have docked in the southern part of New York City. So people arrive from Wales, and uh, and then they find uh, the Welsh organizations that helped uh, sponsor their trip over and uh, get set up uh, how, to, how to deal with a, a new country. So uh, in the next slide, you can actually see where Wales is in relation to England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Ireland, and um, it's, uh, it's a small country, like we, we said, but there's several counties in here. And uh, you can see that over on the left-hand side here. And so my family actually came from a couple of areas here, from Ceredigion and also from uh, it's Carmarthenshire. And uh, Carmarthenshire was actually um, uh, colonized by the Romans. And so in the early... In the early part, about 2,000 years ago, in the AD 40s to AD 60s, they, they invaded. But then some of the Welsh actually adopted the Roman ways, and they became Romanized. And so Carmarthenshire has a town called um, Carmarthen, and, uh, and, and Carmarthen actually has a Roman city in it. And so it was one of the two or three Roman cities that were in the south of Wales here. Those were mining communities, actually, and so the Welsh were miners back then. Um, and were part of the, the Roman Empire. Uh, in the north, if you get into Caradigian, there were fewer Romans in that area, 
but there were still some Roman uh, infrastructure in that area. So there are ancient Roman roads that run through here. And the, and the nation's actually much, much older than that. I mean, uh, the first uh, settlements were about 9,000 years ago, and so 7,000 A.D. Uh, in the island at the far north up there. That's called Anglesey. They find roundhouses in there that date back to the early, first occupation, essentially, of of this area. And then they were big during the Iron Age, they were, uh, the, the settlements in Wales. There were many things that were referred to as hill forts uh, in Wales. And so um, the mountains tend to be in the north and in the south here. So the south, they're called the, the Brecon Beacons. There's some of the high mountains there and the Black Mountain is what, uh, Betwas is very close to the Black Mountain there. And then uh, the one in uh, now, you probably can't pronounce that, but it looks like L-L-A-N-G-W-Y-R-Y-F-O-N. Um, the way that that is pronounced, you take a double L and you pronounce, you put your tongue up at the top of your, the roof of your mouth and you say, so that's Thlen Griffin, Griffin, Thlen Griffin. And so the other one is Betwas, Betwas. And so those are the two homelands that I have uh, for farms in uh, in Wales. Uh, so there is a book on why these folks left. Uh, of course, the nonconformist religion was one of the, the reasons they wanted to go to America for religious uh, opportunity, but also the economic opportunity. In South Wales, there's a lot of industry. There's coal mining, iron mining. And in fact, they used to call it Copperopolis. There was a copper mine. Uh, gold mines, there are tin mines, all sorts of things in uh, in South Wales. And so they also were marketed to as being Welsh. And there were papers that were published in Ohio that say, hey, you should come to Ohio and, you know, expand your horizons, blah, blah, blah. So in this book called Calvinist Incorporated by Ann Kelly Knowles, um, she published this, and I think it's in the Ohio, it's the University of Chicago Press. There it is. Um, it actually lists my great-grandfather and great-grandmother. That's uh, William H. Evans and then Margaret Evans. And you can see that they were from Midway in Thlanguravan. That's where they, uh, that's really her homeland more so. And he came from uh, Blainanti Cadno, which means it's a stream where the fox runs, essentially. And uh, that's in Carmarthenshire. And so they lived in Pennsylvania for a short period of time and then Ohio after that. Um Really pretty fascinating. So I'm going to take you to these places first to show you where they are and give you a sense of what the geography is there. Uh, Thlanguravan is at the very bottom of the large map here. You can see it in the star in the, in the Wales map on the left-hand side there. And they lived on a farm called Penbryn. Uh, so today it's um, it has a slightly different name, but many of the farms were actually named. And so you can go to Penbryn and see where the Owen side of my family came from. And then if you go to the next uh, uh, location, we're going to go see Blind Nanti Cadno. And so here's um, what the land looked like. It's in an area called Minneth Bach, which means Little Mountain. And uh, that's St. Ursula's Church over here on the right-hand side. That would have been the local parish church in Thlanguravan. But that's probably not the church they attended. The nonconformists went to this other meeting house uh, to the to the lower right here, and so but they're very close to one another, and um, you can see Minneth Bach. It's a very desolate landscape. It's Moorish, well, Moor country. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, peat in that area, and you can see some of the natural lakes that are up there as well. It's a land of poets and singers and so forth. And so the Welsh have a festival every year. They call it the Eisteddfod, and the Eisteddfod is where they have the crowning of the bard. And so everybody is a druid, and they have a grand druid uh, who is uh, pro, you know, the master of ceremonies for this sort of thing. And it's all about singing and reciting poetry. Uh, they're very learned people. So the Languravan, here's the, the city sign right there and some of the cattle they raise in this very agriculturally based sort of economy uh, in this area. Now, okay, a little background here also. So one of the things that was interesting is that Wales had a lot of common lands, and many people left in the 1840s because they've, they've kind of forced what they call the enclosures. And so for the first time, people were buying and selling land uh, in mass quantities. And so they opened up and they took away some of the common lands 
and they gave that to the wealthy investors who came in and bought the land. There was actually a small battle that was fought over this in Caradigian here, and it was called the Battle of the Little Englishman. He had bought some of the common land that belonged to all the people of this land, and um, and he proceeded to try to fence it up and build his house. Well, they came around at night and tore his fences down, and then they eventually burned his house down, and then they held him over the flames in order. It's like you need to go back home, <laughs> and uh, and eventually he did. Uh, but uh, but it was one of these places that's that's you know it's part of the history of part of the legacy I would say of the English that they would come into an area and totally abuse the people that were the natives of that land. Uh, so another part of the background here in the old days, you could actually establish in and. Uh, Go to the commons if, if, if it was a suitable place you'd have to ask around hey, i am thinking about building a moonlight cabin or a moonlight house they call a full moon house actually so you'd wait till a full moon and you would have an axe and you would take that axe and you would throw it just as far as you possibly could and that would be where you could put in a round wall around where you're going to build your house the stipulation was that you had to build the house overnight and then you had to stay in it and had to stay in it for an entire year because if you ever left and somebody else came in and stayed in your house, then it's theirs then. And so that's the style. Of, that's what a full moon house is. So there's a handful of full moon houses that still exist. Of course, they built onto them. They build them larger. But most commonly, there would be a hole in the top of a thatched roof, essentially. And uh, they would have a kind of pre-made a door frame and, and the door, and then you would have a pre-made uh, a window essentially to put in, but a very small window to keep the thing uh, warm in the winter time. Um, okay, so next uh, next slide here shows you the farm that's Pen Bren, and uh, the actual house is gone now, but that is the barn that would have existed back when my great great grandfather was a tenant farmer on this land. And uh, you can see the inside of the barn here. I got to meet the folks who own the, the farm now. They're really very nicely uh, hospitable and, and so forth. The actual house, you can see a part of the wall on the left-hand side uh, from the barn in the top photo there at Penn Brand. And here's a photo of it back from the early 1970s before the house had completely fallen in. So my great-great-grandfather lived in that house and would have... Uh, you know, help with chores and things like that. And so he was a tenant farmer in the sense that he, they lived there, took care of the place, but it was somebody else's land that they were doing this for. It was a way to make money back then because people still had to have money to survive. And of course, he would have part of the crops and so forth. It would be partly his. And uh, so this was in a, an area that belonged to Elar. Elar is the town that's up to the north and west from here. So the, the Lord would be up in that area, the, the actual landowner. There's the landowner today uh, at the bottom down here, Rosalind. And so she uh, was kind enough to show us the farm. And it's like, it really was um, very kind and very thoughtful. The, the folks here risk, give you the shirt off their back. Really wonderful people. Just don't try to settle there. <laughs> uh, so there's uh, the map now of my Great grandfather's place, which is in Carmar and close to Carmarthenshire. I think they may have met on the boat, I think, but I'm not sure. Um, there's some suggestion that there was a connection between Carmarthenshire and Caradigian at this time. Of course, they were just over the mountains uh, from one another, essentially, there. Uh, so, but here's the location of Betwas. You can see Ammonford on here, and the Ammon Valley is a large river valley that runs up that way. This is a glaciated landscape, so the rolling hills and everything. But Blinanti Cadno is in this little river valley, a uh, little creek valley that runs into uh, Minneth Betwas. So that's the uh, Betwas Mountain, essentially, there. And uh, the Black Mountain is up to the north of that. There's some books written, actually, on Black Mountain by, uh, oh gosh, what was his name? Uh, he wrote In Patagonia was one of his other books, Bruce Chatwin. So he said On the Black Mountain was one of his books. Very interesting, and it gives you an insight into uh, 18th century Wales. Um, so 18th, 19th century Wales. And Wales was, uh, you know, an ancient, ancient landscape. And so the earliest Welsh would put up landmarks. And so here's one right here, the standing stone that's on the Black Mountain here, Mayan Lila, Thlia. And um, you can see the enclosures in the right-hand side there. So that's what the result was in the 
about the 1740s, 1750s, 1760s, that they began to fence all the lands in that didn't that weren't common areas. The highlands typically were still regarded as common areas at that time. Uh, there's a castle you can see that's a Welsh castle. The Welsh princes were across the landscape here, and when the English came in, they usually couldn't make inroads into the interior of the country, and so they built their castles around the perimeter of the country. And so even Henry the Second, I think it was, who Edward the Second, came in and tried to subjugate the Welsh. He never made it really far into the country. Uh, so that's a, a Carrick Kinnan here, which is a Welsh. Uh, uh, it's a Welsh military installation, essentially, to keep the Saxons out, you know. And then the Normans came in, right? So 11, what was it, uh, 1066, the Norman invasion hit, and they first went into uh, Saxon uh, lands, you know, and, and conquered those first, and then they established themselves in the Welsh lands. Well, the Welsh were more welcoming, but they still didn't want foreigners invading too much, although there are exceptions to that, actually. Um, so that's the Welsh uh, uh, castle right there that was built to keep the Normans at bay. And so the Normans had an area called the Gower, uh, which you're going to see the Gower here in a little bit here. But it's uh, areas to the south where the Normans came in. And uh, I can't tell you how intertwined some of the histories are here. So, for instance, in the Gower, the Norman family, they spoke well, uh, they spoke French, right? And so the French came in, the Normans came in, and uh, in the and the Welsh referred to them as the French, you know, that came in. And there was, you know, probably some hostility. There were struggles a little bit. And so that area in Betwas was actually referred to as Strifeland. Uh, there was that much tension uh, between the, the two countries, essentially. And, uh, but in the Gower... Um, and my family's farm was actually in that strife land. So it was right in that high, you know, it was the first line of defense, essentially, uh, for any sort of Welsh, you know, the Saxon invaders coming in, or excuse me, Norman invaders in this case. Um, so anyway, uh, so that's uh, Carrick Kennan right there. I was going to tell you one little more tidbit here about the, uh, the landscape. Um, of course, it's mountains, right? And so these are uh, mostly right next to the coal fields now. And so my family left before coal mining really took off there. Uh, they were farmers mostly. Uh, if you go to the next slide here, you can see what some of the trails look like. These are what they call Cecil Oaks. They have their acorns upside down. Uh, uh, and they grow on these huge, massive old trees here. So, um, you know, I mentioned the Grand Druids and the Druids of this landscape. There are some ancient, ancient trees and, of course, the Druids worshipped trees. And uh, in some ways, I think they, you know, I think there's, I got some of that, I'm pretty sure, because I love trees. Um, so some of the ancient yew trees, which grew in the churchyards, probably were there before the churches. And so the churches were built in the 1100s, and the, the trees were already there. So many of the trees date back 1,300 years or more. Uh, maybe 1,700 years for one of them, as I recall, one of the ancient yew trees of, uh, of Wales here. Here's some of the, land, the landscape. You see some slugs that are in here and some you know toads and things like that. And then there's lots of sheep and cattle and so forth. There are very few, because only one poisonous snake in all of Great Britain called the, the adder, yeah, the puff adder. And so the, um, the other uh, areas around here, Ammonford was just a whole crossroad with an inn at it, but then Ammonford grew up from that because the railroad went through there. And so Betwas was across the river from that. And so uh, these are very insular people. And so the church in, in Betwas is called St. David's here, and that's uh, in Carmarthenshire here, of course. And there's a sign right before you get to the river, right where the bridge is there, into Ammonford. And it used to be a ford, obviously, there and across the River Ammon. And uh, it said Betwas this way, the e Betwas, and the other one says Ebed, and that means to the world. Okay, so Betwas is that way, the world's that way, and so very insular to uh, to any sort of change and everything. So here's what Blinanti Cadno looks like. That's the ancient house that my great grandfather grew up in, and so there's the barn on the right hand side there, and these folks were really kind to let us in and. I got to go and feel the dirt of that farm and know that my family had looked out across that landscape. Now, this wasn't a spe an especially clear day that we were there, but 
Uh, normally, you could see the Bristol Channel off uh, to the south here. From the other farm, which was also not a very clear day, uh, at Penn, at Penn Bryn, you could actually see the uh, Irish Sea out, uh, you know, across the, the way. And so you know that the lure of the sea was pulling at these people. It's like, we can make a new life for ourselves elsewhere. And so the legacy of South Wales is they were agricultural, really, to begin with. And then the coal mines showed up in about 1820, 1830, 1840, about when my family left. And so they call it the coal measures, right? Because that is uh, the area in the Carboniferous rocks around here that were coal bearing. And so there are sandstones and coals and shales that overlie carbonates. And so the carbonates are lower Carboniferous, and that's what crops out around Swansea, which is where I spent my sabbatical. Uh, so mining, industry, shipping were all part of this sort of like South Wales experience. Uh, today, they manufacture a lot of things still in that setting, and they have a lot of energy that's derived from windmills. And I'll get into other sort of forms of energy as well later on in here. But here I am uh, walking along the Pembrokeshire coast. So if you go out to the tip of Wales, uh, that's Pembrokeshire. And uh, actually, this is one of the places that was settled by Vikings. And the Vikings, they actually said, hey, you guys want to live with us? Come on in. And so uh, my tribe was in that area, actually. So it's, it, the tribe was the Dem Demite. And, uh, and so they said, you know, why don't you guys settle here? And so they did. And so there's some folks with blonde hair and blue eyes and all that sort of thing in, uh, in this sort of southwestern corner of Wales. And they were very welcoming of these early uh, explorers, essentially, that came to look for a new land to live in. And so that was uh, part of this landscape. So here you can see how beautiful the coastline of Wales is. And so those are some of the cliffs. Now, those are actually the equivalent of the rocks at Sicker Point. They're the Bala. That's the same age, you know, Silurian in age, for much of this. And so and there's some more division in there as well, but this is mostly Silurian right here. Uh, so I went on these walks, this incredible sort of landscape, beautiful rocky beaches, beautiful sandy beaches, and this beautiful landscape behind here that's all been glaciated. So the, the land itself has been, that was all under ice. Even the ocean part right there was under ice in the Irish Sea. But, you know, these were hills, and so the glaciers would have uh, drained across this landscape. And eventually, once the ice melted out of the Irish Sea area, the glaciers uh, descended into the, the water and eventually uh, they beveled the landscape at the top. But of course, you can't take off all of the folds and everything that are down below in the subsurface. So everywhere you go in Wales, there are sheep. So they have to keep the sheep in and penned up. And so you have all of these styles. These are referred to as styles right here, uh, where you can cross the fence without putting yourself out too much. So you just climb over these things. And then you can see actually a little... A rope on this one where you can pull it up so your dog can come through and then you drop it down. Everybody in Wales has a dog. Um, that is the symbol for the Cecil Oak you can see up here, but that's also telling you that um, in the sign below that actually, it's the International Appalachian Trail. So the Appalachian Trail, which goes from Georgia all the way up into, into uh, Maine, continues on in Wales because they're the same mountains. And so you, you go on, so you can see the pathway on the right-hand side, and somebody stopped at it, one of the styles and going up this path. So they usually have a low road and a high road on there. Uh, so you can see some peat over here on the left-hand side in the middle at the bottom down here, and you see uh, other types of plants and everything. So the bracken is really f uh, famous for this area. Bracken is like a fern. It grows everywhere around here. Uh, gorse is very common around here as well. Gorse is very prickly and, and spiny. And uh, we'll grab you if it can, you know. So you kind of stick to the trails to keep out of the gorse. Uh, the next spot is probably in religious um, circles would be the most uh, uh, holy of sites in all of Wales. And so that's actually one of the princes of Wales over here, the uh, carving of him over his sarcophagus. And so that's uh, Rhys ap Griffith and uh, the son of Griffith. And so that's at uh, St. David's in Pembrokeshire. And that church was built in the 1100s, 1180s, probably, um, and and uh, absolutely stunning. So the, the town's actually called St. David's as well. And uh, it is a, it was a monastery for a while. There's still a monastic uh, tradition carried on there. 
And uh, but it's really the cultural heartland of Wales right here in this in the south anyway. In the north, it's more of a primitive, uh, natural sort of landscape where uh, Snowdon is really the heartland for North Wales. Um, here's another photo of the Pembrokeshire coast, coast, and that's called uh, Chemics, Chemics uh, Cliffs, I think, Chemis, St. Chemis. And then uh, you see some gorse over here on the right-hand side with some bracken and some of the beautiful wildflowers. I don't know what they all are, but just beautiful along the trails here. Uh, next slide, you can see more of this landscape, some folds in the rocks, vertical uh, beds in these rocks as well. Uh, it's a formidable landscape, so it's not one that very many people have tried to invade from the sea. Um, there was one French um, attempt to invade Wales back in the early 1800s, and uh, the farmers got together, <laughs> rounded up all the French soldiers. Their, their ship essentially had crashed into the shoreline during the Napoleonic Wars, and, uh, and so the French were kind of rounded up and given a good meal and you know sent back on their way. Um, and so here you, you see the, uh, the Irish Sea, essentially, you know, this is Pembrokeshire poking out into the ocean here. Um, so if you go on to the next slide, that's the, that is the geologic map. And so you can see the South Wales coal fields in the gray there. That's going to be Pennsylvanian age, uh, upper Carboniferous. The rocks surrounding that, in fact, are, um, also the, uh, the, the you know, kind of the brown areas are the, are the more coal producing areas. And so the gray is more of the lower Carboniferous, I would say. But yeah, it's all Carboniferous there. The Devonian would include the old red sandstone, right? So that's the brown areas here. The Silurian is actually in the uh, light green. And then so the dark green, in fact, are the uh, Ordovician age rocks. So I guess most of Pembrokeshire is Ordovician. There's some Cambrian there as well, however. And then also some intrusions are in here as, all, as well. Now, because that was so uh, tectonized, many of the fossils that you find in these early Paleozoic rocks are actually stretched. So a trilobite may, may be nine inches long and only about an inch wide. That's the kind of uh, pressure that this landscape was under before it became uh, buried later on. So that is Wales over here on the right-hand side. And you can kind of tell the national boundary kind of follows the geology there as well. And uh, so the Malvern line there is kind of like the, the borderlands for Wales. And it's a very high area. So in England, it's a much lower area. And so the Welsh would come out and steal cattle out of, uh, of England uh, from the hills of Wales here. Now, Liverpool is up here at the north, and that's where my family sailed from. So Liverpool is very, <laughs> there's a lot of Welsh there, actually, in Liverpool. So, uh, but the, the big cities in Wales are mostly in the south then. Uh, Swansea and Card Cardiff are in the south here. And so um, across the Bristol Channel, which is, you know, on the uh, south of Wales here, that's uh, Cornwall, that sort of rocky area that you see in there. And that's actually where most of the tin mines were that the uh, Romans were after. And so also another area that was Romanized back at the uh, beginning of the uh, Christian age, Christian era, so the 80s, when the 80s first started. Um Okay, so in the next slide, you can actually see where some of the, you know, okay, if I back up a little bit now, just to point out a few things, uh, that's called the Welsh Basin in the middle of Wales there. And then uh, I will point out also that uh, Sedgwick brought Darwin to the north of Wales to teach him geology, uh, which is kind of cool. That's a nice legacy to have as well. And so that's written up in a book. You can get that on archive.org if you just look up Darwin and Sedgwick. And... Uh, on the next slide, you can actually see where it was glaciated. At least the last stages of glaciation would have been here. And some of the ice would have been in the Irish Sea as well and been across the, uh, the uh, Bristol Channel as well. But as the ice drained, it cut some of these big U-shaped valleys. Those are called combs, by the way. And so you would have cirques and combs and things like that that were left behind from this glaciation. You can see where the ice extended all over the north of Britain. And you can actually see that the um, English Channel would have been dry at this time. So many of the earliest peoples who migrated into Wales crossed over on dry land. It was much later that there was a breakout flood that eroded the English Channel and had a huge catastrophic flood that uh, kind of separated Britain from the rest of, uh, of Europe at that time. Okay, so what are, who are the migrants that came into this area? Well, the Neanderthals were there first. And they were there all the way about a quarter of a million years ago. 
And then there were pre-Celtic Britons who showed up there about 30,000 years ago. And then the Celts came in, a mass exodus. So the Celts are actually much more of a, a culture than they are a, a cohesive genetic group. And so the Celtic culture came in with some of the braided pottery and things like that around 600 B.C. The Romans came in at the beginning of the current era. And so 48 B.C. is when they uh, first uh, invaded, and then they stayed around till 383 B.C. Uh, most of the um, conflict with the Romans was either in the north of Wales or in the north of Scotland. And so they built walls to try to to keep the uh, Scots out in the north, and uh, in in and they had these sort of fortified, uh, well, they had forts and encampments in uh, Wales as well, and so some of those are still around. But you can see some Roman bridges, and there are some Roman roads that still exist in in Wales. I like to, you know, when I was in Wales, everybody thought I was Italian anyway, and so there's probably some Italian genes that got into the gene pool as well, although nobody has ever been able to successfully establish that. Because R1B1 washed out everything. That's the Y DNA. And uh, so after that, the, the Irish came, actually. And so the Irish landed in the 4th century. And many of the Demite actually came from Ireland as well. Uh, so And then the Vikings came in and settled a little bit in Pembrokeshire in the medieval times. And even in Swansea area, actually. So that's Sven's Sea. And so that was uh, Swansea is this uh, sort of like a Viking settlement, if you will. And then um, it was much later, of course, that the Normans came in in 1067. There was a, a sort of movement. You know, for all this time, they had the, the Welsh princes. There were many, there were many kingdoms in Wales, and they were never unified until they actually had some some oppositions, right? So the English got in there, and it's like all of a sudden they tried to unify some. Well, it was very difficult to unify these tribes because they'd been fighting for centuries, and so the the Celts were very difficult to get them to to join a single tribe, call it Welsh. Uh, so they had, you know, areas that were just, you know, tribal, like the Ordovici, or you had the Salurs, or you had the, uh, you know, the Dimite. And so all of these uh, different tribes wouldn't wouldn't unite very easily. And so they couldn't uh, keep the the Saxons nor the Normans uh, at bay. But much of uh, much of Britain was actually populated by these peoples, and, and many of them were assimilated. Uh, into the Anglo-Saxon and then the Norman uh, peoples later on. Um, there began this pan-nationalism sort of movement for Wales. People wanted to make sure that they didn't lose the language. The language has been in existence since the Celtic invasions. And so um, people recognized their Welshness back in the 1800s, essentially. And that's pretty much when my family left. And there have been more recent uh, immigrations as well. So uh, there's a lot of the African diaspora who has moved into Wales because it's one of the few places where you can still buy a house and live relatively cheaply. And so they may work in London or other places in England and and take the train back home to uh, to their house in Wales. And so uh, there's no there's no racism, really, when it comes right down to it. You know, there are black Welsh and there are uh, Asian Welsh. There are Indian Welsh. Uh, so yeah, they're very accepting of all of these various nationalities. But even if you talk to a black Welsh person, they're going to say, oh, I'm Welsh, you know. And because so there's this sort of like uh, unifying sort of theme. It's like if you live here, you're Welsh. And at least for most people, if you're born there, for sure, you're Welsh. And um, so recent immigrations would include even Eastern Europe. So Russians are there. Uh, the Czechs are there. There's a whole bunch of different uh, groups that have moved into Wales. Okay, so I, I went, when I visited, I went to uh, the Gower. I, li I st lived and stayed in a place called Swansea. That's a town on the south coast there. And uh, on that, uh, there's a peninsula that heads out to the west. And you would think that that would be very, uh, well, it's very popular for walking and things like that. But it has an ancient history. And because it's a peninsula, it's actually kind of separate from the mainland in Wales. So... When culture kind of makes a sweep, it leaves the peninsulas behind, and they're much more um, stayed. They're more laid back in a way, and it's like they're the hillbillies, essentially. And so it's odd because the peninsula goes east and west, 
But the division is actually north and south. In the south is where most of the English live, and they speak English. In the north side of the Gower Peninsula, they speak Welsh still. And and it's um, it's really fascinating. So that is one of the typical sort of houses that you would see on the Gower. The Gower is the name of that peninsula. And uh, one of the ancient structures, that's called Parque Librios, uh burial chamber here. They're called cairns. And so these cairns would be burial chambers where you'd have maybe a half dozen people. And this must have been somebody really important to have that large of a burial chamber. But that dates back about 6,000 years or more. And uh, now Park Librios is a more recent name. And what that really it means is a, it's a park, obviously. But Librios is the Norman name for the Bruce. And so... That Scottish family that's called the Bruce in Scotland is Labrios in Wales. And they were some of those first, you know, lords of this landscape. And so when William the Conqueror came in, he sent his lairds out to, to uh, you know, look over the lands of the island. And Labrios would have been one of those. And so the Bruce is actually just a Norman name. And so the Normans were even in in Scotland, I guess is what I'm saying. So some of the most influential Scottish um, families, in fact, weren't necessarily Scottish. And so the Gordons, in fact, were another group that came in from the Norman conquest. And so the Normans came into the landscape, but they very quickly also adopted the lands that they lived in. So Labrios is a very Welsh family, if you will. Denifower is another one in this area. And so the Denivar um, lands would be part of that Kerig Kinnan uh, Welsh landscape. But once it was Normanized, uh, eventually it became the Denivar um, family holdings. Okay, so next uh, is one of the oldest ceremonial areas in all of the British islands. They've dated the remains that they found. I think it was one skeleton that dates back 33,000 years. Uh, they found it in a cave in a burial in the Gower Peninsula here. Now, this is a really cool photo here because you get two bits of information from it, well, three bits or more. In the far distance, you can actually look across the Bristol Channel and you can see Cornwall or Devonshire, actually, I think Somerset, across the Bristol Channel if you look straight out across the, uh, the water there. And so that's uh, Somerset over there. You can see how flat this landscape is at the top. So it's been beveled by glaciers at the top and yet this is around the perimeter, and so that's been eroded into that sort of flat landscape by stream action in this case, and maybe some glacial action as well. Now, the oceans have come in also, right? So sea level rise over the last 8,000 years has caused this sort of uh, development of, you know, uh, shoreline sort of topographies where you get uh, wave cut notches, wave cut benches, and that sort of thing as well. But the rocks here are part of the lower Carboniferous. And so those are the same age as the rocks in Springfield. So one of the things that I wanted to do, I was out looking specifically for Walsorsian mounds in this sort of landscape uh, to see if I could find some because they've never been described from this area uh, previously. But I saw these beautiful rocks and I never found any Walsorsian mounds. But I did see this beautiful landscape. And that's actually a hill fort on the right-hand side. You can see the, the rubble at the top of the hill there. That would have been an area that would have been Iron Age fort of sorts uh, for the early uh, pre-Celtic peoples that were living on this landscape. So uh, the next one is a place called Arthur's, uh, uh, let's see, it's Arthur's Stone, I think it is here. And this is up on top of a hill. It's hard to tell you're on a hill here, but you're right in the middle of the Gower here. Actually, it's not exactly at the top of the hill. It's it's kind of off on the shoulders of the hill here on the on to the north, and you can see the opposite side. So that's a across a channel over here that that is the other side of the Gower Peninsula. So you can see um, a little town called Flankenneth, and actually that's. Uh, Oh, Flan Roosted maybe over here uh, in that little valley with the, the woods and everything. And, but then that channel on the opposite side over there is where the River Ammon comes out. And that's the land, uh, Thandovi, I think it is, across the bay over there. I'd have to look that up, but I'm not quite sure. So this is an ancient uh, stone monument to, well, King Arthur essentially, right? And it's odd because it actually has a historical significance as well when 
the French came in here in the 1700s, I think it was. There was a French pilgrimage, actually. Uh, the French were coming during the War of Roses or something like that. Maybe it was a little after the War of Roses. Uh, but they, they came in to, you know, celebrate the King Arthur. This was where he traditionally, this was his landscape, essentially, back then. Um, so... On uh, the next slide, you can actually see Pentry even. Now you can tell that that's, you know, the Evans is where the, the derivation is for that, right? So, But that's a cap rock. They call these dolmens. And so and they're standing stones that have a cap over the top, and there would have been earthworks around it, and it would have been a burial chamber. And so you can see that uh, this is uh, prehistoric, obviously, but it's made out of the same rock in the Presseli Hills, which are around in here. Uh, that they made Stonehenge out of. And so this dates back to a roughly the same age as Stonehenge, pre-Celtic in origin. Um, another one here, this is from the island of Anglesey. This is uh, the Circle Huts in Holyhead. And so this is in uh, some of the earliest dwellings that they found in Wales, and it's at the very northern part of Wales here. And you can see that... Uh, and here you can actually, you know, if you went over the hill and just looked, peered over the hill, you'd see that lighthouse. And so that's the northern end of Anglesey right here. So as soon as the glaciers melted, people flocked into this landscape to, you know, become farmers and hunter-gatherers first, I suppose, but then farmers afterwards. So that's the island of Anglesey uh, right there. And then uh, here's a Google Earth image of uh, the Bulwark. That's on the Gower Peninsula. It's one of these earthen forts. It's not really earth, and it's mostly a rubble pile of rocks, but a series of moats. And so these are called hill forts. And uh, so this is some of that Iron Age sort of uh, uh, structure that you would get in many of the hilltops in Wales. Uh, what, a, what an incredible historic landscape. Every time you walk somewhere, you're walking in a place where somebody has walked thousands of years ago. And um, so it's really... There's this appeal to uh, folks who value history in these ancient landscapes like this. Okay, so today, uh, well, here's Penny Van. This is the high spot in the south of Wales here. And it was an especially warm day in October. And so uh, a host of mine who was in the photograph over here on the right-hand side, he's peering back, or actually peering down into the saddle of and looking at the flat top version of, uh, of Penny Van there. And so at the very top of this, of course, there must have been 200 people <laughs> that had walked up the uh, trail that day. And this is in the Brecon Beacons. So this is the national park that's in the south of Wales here. 75% uh, of the residents of Wales were born in Wales. And about 66% of them consider themselves to be Welsh. And then 26% consider themselves to be British, which is the larger idea, right? So... If you say that you're British, that means you could be Scottish or English or Irish, you know, Irish, uh, Anglo-Irish or whatever. And so, but say when you say British, you belong to that island, essentially. And uh, when you say that you're English, that means that land that's on the other side of the border, okay? So when you identify yourself as English, you're living in a foreign country. And there's 4% that are just other. So immigrants who haven't yet adopted any sort of nationality, I suppose, other than the one that they were native to. Uh, but this beautiful landscape. Uh, here again, you see one of these coombs that's off to the left here from Penny Van, looking out towards the Brecon Beacons here. It's just a beautiful um, glaciated landscape, just gorgeous uh, sort of place. So in Wales, there is a lot of politics in Wales, and there's the north and south divide, essentially. Um, the north, it, they consider themselves to be more patriotic and more Welsh. You're more likely to hear Welsh spoken there. If you're in the Gower, good luck trying to hear somebody speak actually Welsh because most of those folks have immigrated in from England or from other places. And if you're in the north of the Gower, you might hear some Welsh as well. So, But but that's the only place around Swansea where you're going to hear, hear Welsh is in the north of the Gower until you get into Carmarthenshire. And in Carmarthenshire, you'll hear some Welsh as, as well. And I may be totally out to lunch on this, but that is it was one of the things I'd really hoped to do is to learn Welsh language. And I didn't get a chance to do that because there were no native Welsh speakers around me when I was dwelling in Swansea. That's not 
actually accurate. I'm sure there were. I just didn't, I didn't hunt them out and find them so that I could learn to speak Welsh. Uh, but, you know, my family coming from the south of Wales, I would have spoken a slightly different dialect than what they speak in the north. And so in the north and mid Wales, they speak a lot of Welsh language. And the north and south differ. So, uh, for instance, the, uh, if I were to ask you, how are you doing? How are you doing? And it's like you would say, Shadahi. That's, that's the term or that's the phrase that you would use in the north of Wales. If you're in the south, it's more like Shadahi. And so, um, that's, you know, how's it going? You know, Shadahi. Um, Dayun. Uh, that means good. Uh, uh, Borada. Good morning. Uh, Nosvaitha. Good night. Um, so it's really fascinating, and it's like, and I still have a desire to learn this language, okay? So I'm getting kind of old to learn a language, I'm afraid, but um, I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe not. People say that you can always adapt to a new language. It'll, it'll make you smarter when you learn more languages. Um, in North Wales, they've maintained their independence a lot longer. So in South Wales, of course, the Romans came in first and subjugated the Welsh there, but willingly for the most part, and not always, but in, in, in part, um, so South Wales was Romanized. And the English came in. They mostly adopted South Wales as that landscape. They became the managers for the mines and the shopkeepers and things like that. Although there were a lot of Welsh that were shopkeepers as well. Uh, there's more industry in the South. And so there was a lot more money in the South as well. And so the, the North tended to be more agricultural and more uh, isolated from uh, modern societies, even in the 18th, 1800s. If you want to go see a good movie that reflects the Welsh character, uh, you could see the movie. It mostly has Irish actors in it, but it uh, it is called How Green Was My Valley. And uh, it's a very old film, 1950s. It had Roddy McDowell, I think. So even the, the lead actor in the movie was Scottish. But uh, but it was really good. And they, they would sing. And that's what the Welsh do really well is they sing. Um in South Wales, they have the large cities, of course, as well. Uh, if you were to divide Wales, uh, a lot of people think that there are uh, three divisions. And so in 1921, Zimmern said that there's the archetypical Welsh Wales, you know, the ancient Welsh. And then there's the American industrial Wales of the South. And then there was the upper class English Welsh. And so the upper class would be the lairds and the, and the uh, captains of industry and so forth. In 1985... There was somewhat of a revision by Balson here. And he says, well, there's still this sort of arch archetypical uh, Welsh area. So that's the, the Welsh-speaking peoples of North Wales. And there's a political party that actually is associated with that. They call it Plaid Cymru. And so that, in fact, uh, refers to the Celtic sort of nature of the Welsh and their streak for independence. And then there's the English-speaking Welsh Wales. And so they consider themselves to be Welsh, but they speak English. And that's in the South Valleys. And so uh, in uh, close to Cardiff, Cardiff and other places in the South here. Um, and that's mostly Labor Party folks, that uh, people that are the miners and the, uh, and the uh, people who work in the industries. Uh, and then lastly, there's the British Welsh, uh, Welsh, which is along the South Coast and mostly the East. And they're the conservative and the liberal Democrats and, and politically. So let's go to the north first. Well, you've already seen some of the south. Um, here's a place called Isbith Even. Again, you see the Evans in there, right? So Isbith Even was a hospital, and it was also a, uh, a center for hospitality. So hospitals originally were more like hostels, and they were places that gave you sanctuary. So if you were a traveler, you could stay at uh, Isbith Even and be protected from the bandits that roved across the countryside. So the north, being a poorer area, there were a lot more bandits in that area, and that's where many of the Welsh pirates, although Henry Morgan came from Newport in the south, and so uh, there was a certain streak. There's an old saying, uh, uh, Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a thief, and so there's a lot of thinking that, you know, Crime and being Welsh go hand in hand with one another. That's mostly a uh, English perspective from the people who lost cattle from the borderlands. Um, but anyway, it's a beautiful landscape. And uh, here you can see, here's this river flowing through Isbithy even. You can see over here is the church. Uh, we visited that. And here's some of these ancient yew trees. These trees here are roughly 800 to 1,000 years old. 
Um, and they grow in the in the cemeteries, obviously, in the churchyards here. So that church dates back to about 1100 or so. It is the place where Abraham Lincoln's great-grandmother came from. And so he has some Welsh ancestry as well. Uh, so, you know, mostly from Lincolnshire, I suppo uh, suppose, for his British ancestry. But here his great-grandmother came from Isbeth even. Um, on the next slide, you can see Betasicoid and uh, in Kapelkerig. And so these are areas around Snowdon. And um, that is a more recent bridge there. But on the right-hand side, and you're really going to have to look for it, there is a Roman bridge. You can see strands of ivy hanging from that bridge. That bridge dates back 2,000 years, and it was built by probably Welsh people for the Romans. And so the Romans built roads everywhere, even in the north. And so um, beautiful landscape. So many of the valleys in here, uh, very rugged landscape. In the next uh, photo, you can see some of the, the huge mountains, Triffin and, and Flin Ogwen. Um, in, um, and this is in the north of Wales. And so this is a photograph taken from a comb overlooking some of the waterfalls and so forth here at Triffin and uh, Coom Idol, Idwal. And uh, that's the uh, place where the, that's the lake up here you see in the, the lower left-hand side here, you're looking down, um, and then you can see glaciated valleys, and you can see where the river today runs through this sort of rocky landscape. Uh, so this is up in Snowdon. This is really the heartland for much of Wales. If St. David's was the heartland in the south, this is the heartland, in fact, for the north. Um, beautiful place. So here's another type of uh, style. They call that a ladder style. And, um, you know, it, it makes it easy to get over the the walls and the pens and so forth here. Uh, here's Snowden in the next photo here. This was taken from Kapelkerig, and uh, we were at a uh, campground, I think, there. It, uh, Cap the Snowden was one of the places where Sir Edmund Hillary practiced in order to uh, climb Mount Everest. And so that's Tenzing, uh, Nor Norgay, Tenzing, Tenzing Norgay on the right-hand side, and uh, Sir Edmund Hillary on the left there, and, of course, that's uh, Everest behind them there. And so they practiced on Snowden for their skills. Um, if you look at the royal family, uh, uh, Charles is regarded as the Prince of Wales. He is the Prince of Wales. And uh, he is was crowned Prince of Wales at a ceremony called the Investiture. And the Investiture happens at this castle in the north of Wales. And this is Car um Carnarvon Castle, and uh, I have to pronounce, I'm thinking about my Welsh pronunciation, Carnarvon, and uh, so the C is always a hard C, and uh, so Carnarvon Castle was built by Edward II, I think it was, and this would date back to about 1200 AD. Uh, it kind of guards the port area, and there's really a, kind of a pass that goes in between Anglesey, they have the Manai, uh, Manai Bridge that crosses over onto Anglesey. And so this is an area when they were still having ferries that run across over to Anglesey that they would depart from Carnarvon here. Uh, so it's a walled city. It's an ancient walled city. And you can see here an inn that was built around the outside of the city, in fact. Uh, and then the walled city, you can see some of the probably 19th century, early 19th century structures that were in the city as well. So the investiture is a big thing here. Uh, in the next castle, it's another one built by Edward II. This were, these were built to subjugate the Welsh, essentially. So as soon as he could uh, defeat the, the Welsh uh, princes, he began to build castles and then to dominate the landscape. And they also became the trading centers. So if he couldn't get them uh, militarily to, uh, to capitulate, he would do it through economic means. And so it's kind of the same thing that's happening today with economic slavery in the capitalist societies uh, as well. And um, and so you get people to do your bidding essentially just by offering them a job. <laughs> and uh, so this is uh, Conway Castle right here. So this is in the town of Conway in the north of Wales here, built again on a rock. Um, this is one of the places where Owen Glendower, I think, uh, was defeated. Owen Glendower tried to uh, defeat the Brit the English here. And uh, he was unsuccessful, and eventually Edward uh, was able to uh, to capture him, and they uh, beheaded him and put his head on a spike, essentially a, a pike here, in uh, in this castle in Conway. 
Uh, if you look at Conway from the city wall here, this is kind of like the northern part of the city wall looking at the harbor here. You didn't have to defend on the harbor because you weren't expecting any sort of maritime attacks, but the castle's over there in the distance. And so this is part of the city wall. It goes all the way around Conway. There's a Telford Bridge here that's really pretty famous as well. Uh, also in Conway, you'll see things like the William Wordsworth uh, poem here was written for this landscape, and it was the uh, in a cemetery here. He wrote the uh, We Are Seven poem there. So if, if you're interested in that sort of thing, it's uh, pretty fascinating, a very profound sort of Wordsworth poem about death and uh, how you have kinship regardless of whether people are alive or dead. We are seven. And uh, so Aber Conway is the oldest house built in the 14th century here. Uh, the, the city walls are much older, but the oldest house in the, in the city, that means it was built in the 1300s. Here's also the smallest uh, house in Great Britain, uh, built uh, adjacent and right next to the city wall there. And a woman who's in the traditional Welsh garb, essentially, here. Uh, it's a very touristy sort of pay, uh, place. If we go to the south, here's uh, Swansea. Swansea's a modern, thriving city with high skyscrapers. And uh, the, the skyscraper on the left-hand side here overlooking Swansea Bay there, if you went over the top of it, you'd be in Mumbles, the other side of the uh, of the bay over there. And uh, so the river, oh gosh, River Aaron, was it, uh, that comes out? Ab Taffy, Ab Abertaffy, Abertawi uh, dumps into the bay uh, right at uh, Swansea here. So there were a lot of mills and, and industrial sort of installations along this uh, sort of landscape. And here you are from um, looking off towards the southwest, and you see over much of the city. Now, many of the buildings in, in Swansea were actually destroyed by the Germans and the Luftwaffe. They bombed the hell out of this landscape because it was an industrial center, of course, during World War II. And so you can see all, most of the buildings are new and, and post-date, uh, at least in the downtown area, they post-date the uh, World War II era. Here you can see some of the older houses, though. For instance, uh, maybe you're familiar with Dylan Thomas, Do Not Go Gently Into That Good Night. Uh, old age should burn and rave at the close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And that's a statue of Dylan Thomas down here on the left. He's the, you know, the, the local son, local poet, and that's where he lived, actually. That's where he grew up at 5 Coombe Duncan Drive. And that's actually the part of Swansea that I lived in, which was the Uplands area. Um, if I were to go back again, it was really nice because you're within, I don't know, maybe five blocks, eight, ten blocks maybe of Swansea University or the uni as they call it there. And, um, really a lot of fun. Uh, you're really close. And maybe, I'd, you know, Uplands was nice. Uplands was real nice, but they were all row houses, right? So there's no backyards to speak of, very tiny backyards. Here's a, in the next slide, I'm showing you from the mumbles here now what it looks like at high tide and low tide. <laughs> Actually, that's not the high, well, yeah, it's pretty close to the highest tide there. So that's high tide and low tide. And then you can see out here uh, from the end of this pier, that's looking in between the the openings between, you can see the lighthouse on the left-hand side. And there's an opening that's in between that island and then the island and then the, the Mumbles itself, uh, the peninsula in Mumbles. And so, so that's that island you can see in the upper part up there. So I rode my bicycle out here uh, to take the beginning of the day and the end of the day. Uh, when the uh, when the tides had changed. When it cleared off, you can actually look across the Bristol Channel there again, and you can see Somerset over there. Um, this is actually a life. Uh, uh, RNLI stands for the Royal National Lifeboat Institute. And so it's not a government agency, although they're partially funded by the government, but uh, people make donations and so forth for the RNLI, and they save a lot of lives that way. Um so very, very uh, common that you would see people, they're very historic people in many ways about how they would go out and to shipwrecks. And then there's also the stories about how they would cause shipwrecks on the, uh, on the Gower. The Gower is really a beautiful place. In the next uh, little inset here, you can actually see where Swansea Bay is in there. They propose to build a tidal basin there that will help generate electricity. And that's kind of a neat project. It's going to generate about 320 uh, megawatts of energy, they think, with some tunnels and impellers to uh, to generate the electricity. Um, 
Here's uh, another photo now of Swansea. That's one of the pedestrian bridges across the Towie. And then they have what they call the prom, which is the promenade that goes along the coastline here. Kind of a wooded, you're only about 50 yards off of the, uh, of the bay itself here. A uh, nice uh, place to ride your bicycle. This is downtown then at the harbor. I uh, have my little mini bike there, packed it up, shipped it over in a suitcase and put it all back together. And I uh, was able to uh, to ride around a little bit over there anyway. And uh, I did a lot of walking. Um, in the next slide, you can see the uni. And it was the Welsh University of the Year in Wales here. And um, there's not that many Welsh universities, I guess I would say, to begin with. There's one in Cardiff. There's one in Aberystwyth, which is in the west. And then there's one at Bangor in the north. And so uh, of the four universities, this was the one that was all best this year anyway. It was founded in 1920, so it's even younger than what Missouri State is. Uh, but they have a couple of different campuses, and it's roughly the same size. So there are 20-some thousand students who attend university here. Absolutely love the place. And there was a science um, meeting that was held here. That's the Academy of Sciences, essentially, for, um, for all of Britain was held here in Swansea when I was there. Got to hear talks about the Anthropocene and a bunch of other sort of uh, Anthropocene. And uh, so they have their own medical school. They've got, I think, a law school, but I'm not sure. That may be in Cardiff. Uh, about 330 programs, though. And some of the programs are actually taught in Welsh. So when I say that there are no Welsh speakers in Swansea, that's not accurate because the teachers here teach in Welsh as well. And many of the students speak Welsh. You could hear some of the students speaking Welsh to, uh, amongst themselves. Um, okay, so what was I doing there? I was like writing a new, uh, writing one of my papers actually on Antarctica. So I finally finished up a paper that had been languishing for years. And then I got to go and meet with uh, uh, Garrett Owen, who was my host essentially at uh, the uni. And he took me on several field trips. And so I got to go out in the field with him. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see some of the millstone grits here. Uh, they're, they're Mississippian in age. Uh, on the right-hand side, this is one of his uh, teaching assistants here in the foreground. She's of African descent, uh, really, and she's a graduate student. And so here are the students lined up along uh, one of the, the country roads here. This is on the Black Mountain, and we're looking at some of the rocks here that are Carboniferous in age, but we're looking at the entire succession, in fact. So they're drawing some of the structures that they see in the road cuts here, and there's a lot more structure to see directly out in the field here. Uh, on the, the lower right here, excuse me, in the, in the middle part here on the left is a whole series of students. They're looking at shale uh, that has some conodonts and a bunch of other sorts of fossils in it. And so everybody's looking for fossils there. On the right-hand side, there's, there are structures that are exposed at low tide right in, uh, this is called Bracelet Bay. This is on the opposite side of the Mumbles here. So you have to drive through the Mumbles Park and then uh, come out. And these are barnacle encrusted rocks, but you still see the structure. So these are actually Mississippian in age as well, so lower carboniferous. And uh, students going out doing a mapping project, making form lines on the on their map, and essentially a uh, air photo. And so th that's a class that actually deals with um, physical geography. So he teaches physical geography. This wasn't even a geology course, and they're learning about structure. So. Um, there's a different system when you're in the British system. They expect you to know everything that you would get in your general education before you arrive at the university. And so when you come to the university, you're there to learn your specialty. And so uh, these are going to be geographers. And so they're getting the physical geography here. Um, and the next slide here, this is on the Gower. This is the very tip of the Gower in the west. And it's a place called Great Wormhead. And you can see that in the central uh, image here. And you can see some of the Mississippian age rocks that were beveled in that uh, landscape by the, you know, it's a, it's a wave cut terrace. There's a little uh, sea arch in there as well. Uh, you have to carefully time when you go across because you could get stuck out there for 12 hours if you don't get make it back. And so you get about a five hour window. You got to go out early <laughs> as soon as it, you know, while it's still wet, essentially, and then come back before the water starts coming in. There are people that are killed here and drown all the time um, where these rocks are. You can see these people walking across. So that's normally underwater there. You saw, you saw what the tides do there. <laughs> so Great Wormhead is kind of cool. I got to climb to the top of Great Wormhead uh, and then make my way back. Seals out there. 
Uh, there are fishermen out there. There are boats uh, around the perimeter of this. And if you look on the opposite side of this, you're actually looking at Ross Ely uh, Beach. And so you can't see it in this, but I think you saw Ross Ely Beach in an earlier photograph uh, in this presentation. So absolutely stunning. So the people actually surf in this uh, area as well. Waves are good enough for a nice shore break when you get into Ross Ely. Um, there's an inn here, Ross Ely. Ross Ely is one of the places where Edgar Evans was uh, from. He, uh, he was a, uh, a Welshman who was in Scott's uh, company, Robert Falcon Scott, who did the Antarctic expeditions. And so I really wanted to see where Edgar Evans was from. So, you know, same name. And I'm actually, you know, like when I when I go to this area, you know, and they look at my credit card, oh, he's one of ours. You know, I actually got that. I really like that. Um, and, you know, I'm an American, you know, but at the same time, they recognize my roots as being Welsh as well. So that was kind of appealing for me. My God, it's just an incredible place to visit. So this is the last slide here, but just to show you what it looks like. This is Oxwich Beach in the, in the upper right here. There are wild Welsh ponies who cross this landscape. So the Welsh ponies are everywhere. They're considered a nuisance by a lot of people, but I was able to pet one. You know, it's like they're, they're not exactly tame, but I got to, uh, you know, I guess they horses are really good at knowing the intentions of people. And so, you know, this is the Welsh ponies, famous for the uh, running along the beaches and so forth here. Here's one of the enclosures at the bottom down here. This is one of the, you know, this is the castle, in fact, at Three Cliffs Harbor here, Three Cliffs Bay. A stunning landscape to, to walk across. And then um, this is close to, gosh, I'll have to think about the name of it. Yeah, I'm not going to be able to pull the name out of this. The Welsh names are too exotic for me. But uh, that's, um, I think it's uh, Kevin Bryn is the name of the hill where the two ponies are on there. This is my host on the right-hand photo here with one of the big Cecil Oaks here. That's uh, Garrett Owen and his wife, Wendy, who were kind enough to take me on the field trips that they did for some of their walking group as well. Uh, so they do organize walks and things like that. And he leads some of the geology field trips for local people here as well. So that's pretty much it for uh, the Welsh uh, presentation here. Not a whole lot of geology, but a little bit in here interspersed with the great scenery and some of the historic narrative as well. I guess what I would encourage you to do is find your roots. Uh, I know some of you are probably Welsh, like uh, Williams is one of the Welsh names. Nancy's part Welsh. She's part Scottish and a few other things as well as we are here in the United States. But uh, find your roots. And whenever whenever you travel someplace, um, don't consider yourself to be a tourist. Be a traveler. And so you want to go to a place and learn from it. And so and travel is really kind of transformative. I've experienced that many times over now with trips to well, Wales and Scotland and England. And I've been to Germany and, and France and I've been to um, various places, Thailand. I've been to New Zealand and Antarctica, um, even Hawaii, even in the domestic sort of landscape of North America. There are these wonderful places to visit and be a traveler and be a learner. And uh, people will respect you for that. Um, thanks. I'll talk to you soon. Bye now.